Good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is Eli Horwat. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, for five years, the Illuminator has facilitated graffiti-like seizures of institutional architecture to amplify a multitude of voices. They've worked with organized social movements like Occupy Wall Street, Hands Up United, Black Youth Project 100, and Dalit Women Fight, and more broadly publicized the fight for abortion rights and student debt relief, and the fight against corporate tax evasion, exploitative real estate companies, and the flow of petro capital into museums. They've worked to create site-specific counter spectacles that transform the facades of institutions into screens for the public airing of grievances, where the once fortified architectures of bureaucratic structures are inverted into a canvas for the marginalized and the dispossessed. In the essay, Towards a Semiological Guerrilla Warfare, Umberto Eco calls for, quote, non-industrial forms of communication that feature a constant correction of perspectives, the checking of codes, the ever-renewed interpretations of mass messages. The universe of technological communication would then be patrolled by groups of communications guerrillas who would restore a critical dimension to passive reception, end quote. While it's easy to accuse Echo of romanticism, the illuminator reflects a much needed optimism of the will in a time plagued by the pessimism of the intellect. In their show, Wall, Street, Period, installed across the hall at the Clifford Gallery and opening immediately following this talk, the illuminator have assembled an interactive protest generator where visitors are encouraged to add their grievances, hopes, and demands to a virtual demonstration in real time. Working with Colgate students, they have also demarcated a space that will become populated by their own on-campus interventions. From the Illuminator to de deliver today's talk is Grayson Earle, whose diverse technological practice is unified by a political approach to media making. Employing video games, video projection, algorithmic audiovisual generation, biological organisms, and robotics, his work intervenes on physical spaces and entrenched ideas. His creative practice articulates a repositioning of resistance to power that invites participation from citizens. Earl teaches at Hunter College uh, and splits his time between the computer science, film and media, and integrated media arts and studio art labs and programs. Uh, this interdisciplinary posture is emblematic of his work as an artist. Recent exhibitions include Soul Arts in South Korea, Eastern Bloc, and Center Phi in Montreal, the Brooklyn Museum, Macy Gallery, and Baby Castles in New York City, as well as the Media Arts Festival in Tokyo. He's published essays on the socioeconomic implications of the Cold War on abstract expressionism in the United States and Russia, as well as new methods for rhetorical approaches in video games. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Grayson Earle. Hey, how are we doing? Uh, I used to be in a rock band, and when I would ask that question, people would scream. I sort of missed that. Um, I'm here as a representative uh, of the Illuminator Collective, as is Rachel Brown, who's here in the audience. Hopefully you'll get a chance to meet her later. Um, the other members are safely back in New York City. Um, I, uh, I have a kind of a childish disdain for PowerPoint presentations and prefer to be a little more improvisational and transparent. So it's not that I was too lazy to make one. Uh, you're just going to see uh, me kind of navigating through my files and folders as I deliver this presentation. Um, the first thing that, uh, and I can, I can minimize my Spotify now. <laughs> the, uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is just what we are in a very uh, material sense of of the word, um, and we are. I'm gonna open this. One. Um, we are essentially a van with a high powered projector on top. Um, we came out of Occupy Wall Street, and there we go. Um, we uh, we collectively own this van. It's a projector that's about as powerful as the one in this room, um, and we custom retrofitted the top of our vehicle to have a sort of a square cut in the top of it. And then there's a periscoping platform that you can kind of crank up through the hole and then aim around at any buildings or whatever you want to sort of project onto. 
Um, this is me on top of the van. Uh, it's a truly a sort of grassroots nuts and bolts project. Uh, the projector breaks down from time to time in the middle of the street and is sort of haphazardly strapped onto that wooden platform. Um, this is the inside of the van. Uh, you can see there's just cables kind of dangling around. Um, uh, that's a better picture of the hatch with one of our members, uh, Mark Reed, peeking through. Um, this is us driving the van. And this is a shot of us projecting onto the, to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, just to give you some context for kind of how this machine literally works. Um, and I'm going to talk to you mostly about kind of my entry point and contributions to the group. Um, I actually don't come from a fine arts background, uh, but rather a kind of a computer science or a hacking background. Um, I started getting really interested in computers when I was very young and kind of taught myself programming through many years of frustration and eventually um, turned that into uh, kind of an early career in making video games that then kind of led to uh, uh, a hobby of hacking video games to get uh, the upper hand on my opponents. And then it turned into kind of a more serious sort of proto-political digital activist kind of persona uh, where I would kind of swoop into message boards or um, change things on my school's website or what have you. Um, and it wasn't, uh, I, I always wanted to be, after, after all of this happened and I was sort of like involved in computers, I decided that I wanted to be the next Alfonso Cuaron and make science fiction films. And when I got into University of California in Irvine and started to make my own films, I quickly discovered that I wasn't any good at it because I lacked the patience that a filmmaker must have. Um, but it did, uh, sort of stumble me into, uh, critical theory and feminist theory uh, under the direction of people like uh, Slava Zizek and Judith Butler and Angela Davis who visited UC Irvine when I was there. Um, and that got me thinking a lot about advertisements and public spaces. And it was right around the time that street art was sort of in vogue and Banksy's popularity was soaring. Um, and I couldn't draw or paint at all. I still can't. Um, but I could use a computer, and so I was sort of trying to think about how I would do that kind of art with the skills that I have. Uh, and then Occupy Wall Street rolls around, um, uh, shortly followed by the Quebec student protests, or I should say the Canadian student protests in 2011 and 2012. Um, and I'm going to show you some photos from this. Um, so, uh, as you may or may not know, in 2011, 2012, the, uh, the government of, of Quebec and Canada decided to increase tuition uh, on students that were attending those universities. And this was met with much resistance. Uh, we're talking about in Montreal, a city of three or four million people, having 300,000 people in the streets for several days in a row. Um, and so, initially, the government sort of acquiesced, but then uh, implemented a new anti-protest law called P6. And P6 uh, mandated that you could not have an, uh, a political demonstration with more than 50 people at a time unless you get uh, permission from the police, which involves giving them a name, uh, the names of everyone involved and submitting uh, a map of where you're going to be walking for the demonstration. And actually, this, this is uh, one of my favorite things from that era uh, this was a, a student submission for a demonstration route that they were going to take. Um, they sent it to the police. Um, and this kind of creative response is the sort of thing that I'm interested in. Um, so I'm going to show you our, uh, our video from there. Um, and this is also playing uh, in the gallery over there, so I may choose to kind of make it a, a bit more brief. Here, oopsie, the downfall of my anti-PowerPoint plan here. Quand le gouvernement avait décidé, ben avait déposé son budget par rapport, son budget financier pour le pour l'année, 
puis qu'il qu allait avoir une coupe dans le budget pour avoir l'éducation. Puis c'était la première fois que je voyais autant de gens ensemble, puis, puis des gens qui étaient vraiment fâchés, c'est comme des étudiants qui étaient plus vieux que moi, puis qui, qui, qui comprenaient plus. students who see the student movement as the standard of what a social movement looks like and who were trained in what a general assembly is like and what mobilization is like and how to do art that's visible and, and so it's much more about kind of the experience that happened as a result of it that a social movement is possible it's not a thing of the past it's us it's our generation that's making it happen <laughs> This is subversive. It must be illegal thing. And then we smile at each other and say, "Well, oh, that's a really cool thing to have because we have usually on this building is just like uh, some kind of publicity, propaganda to sell us uh, uh, some product." We looked at that, and we also remember the student strikes, the movements when we were in these streets. 
So that phrase at the top, on et puke cinq ans, means we are more than 50, and it was a phrase that we projected repeatedly onto the buildings um, to sort of contest the law that stated that there could only be 50 people. Um, the idea being that we could use technology to creatively circumvent and outpace our adversaries. So they can ban the protests of 50 people, but they didn't ban a virtual protest that only required three people that put hundreds of people into the streets. Um, and of course, we eventually learned that it wasn't really about um, some kind of arbitrary number of people, but about uh, you know state oppression of uh, of 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 what the students were after and what you know the citizens of Montreal were after. So even though we sort of followed the law, we uh, we did end up getting into a little bit of trouble. Um, and the way that uh, that project was accomplished was um, I traveled to Montreal uh, a month ahead of the group um, and kind of met with student activists there and held a sign making party and had, you know, just sort of provided pizza and beer um, and allowed people to kind of revisit the, their protest days, you know, from the student movement and, excuse me, um, and draw out these signs. Um, and this is... Uh, what is this? I don't know. I don't speak French. Only that first part. Um, but people would write their sign and then sort of stand and walk in front of a green screen. Um, and then in that way, we were able to capture them. And you saw those sort of white silhouettes walking projected. Um, we were able to capture them and their message and put them back into the streets. Um, and that's a kind of like a progress shot of how that works. Um, let me see. Uh, there have been other opportunities uh, to kind of creatively uh, respond to certain things. Um, this is Five Points in New York City. Uh, is anyone familiar with this? Yeah, wow, nice. Uh, rest in peace, right? Um, it was a kind of a graffiti mecca in uh, Long Island City that, uh, through the leadership of uh, Mears One here, um, kind of was on its way to being uh, a landmark, a cultural landmark. Uh, he got, he coordinated street artists from all over the world to come and uh, take part in painting this building. Uh, there were new artists, honestly, every day, every at least every week, but I saw people there every time I went, uh, making new work and kind of like cycling it in and out. Uh, and then at some point, the building owner, who Mears had a relationship with, uh, decided to uh, overnight cover the entire building and uh, hand it over to real estate development. So this is what the building looked like at that point. Um, so I developed uh, this software that we call the People's Pad. And by the way, all of the software that we use uh, in the group, all of it, the stuff that we make anyway is open source and available for everyone to use, and we encourage that. And I'll post um, our website at the end here in case you're interested. Um, but what, uh, what we were able to do was come back and work with some of the graffiti artists that had their work uh, disappeared from that building. And this is what that looks like. I did it again. So I'm going to pause it for a second. So this is, uh, the way that it works is there's a, an egg crate, just like a crate. Is it a milk crate? That's what it is. Um, and then you get a webcam and some lights sort of pointed down at a piece of paper like this, and then you have a Sharpie, and you just sort of draw. Um, and then that, because there's a webcam, gets interpreted by the software here, um, and sort of processes the image, cleans it up, allows you to map it and stuff, and then you're left with this. Um, and so in that way, we're able to get those artists work back on the wall uh, one last time. And the, the sort of poetry to this is that uh, even though they decided to wipe the building using white paint, thinking that that would get rid of the, the, the artist's work, that actually made it the ideal projection surface for us. Uh, here's another video of 
the people's pad in action just to give you a good idea of how it works. This was on a collaboration with Greenpeace in Portland, Oregon for the End the Age of Coal campaign. What I like about this is that it's really easy to use and everyone immediately knows how to engage with it. It's low tech, high tech stuff. What do I got next? Um, and uh, a few years back, um, some artists decided to install a statue of Edward Snowden in Fort Greene Park in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I guess I'll let them do the talking this this by the way was this part was not our project but I'll get to that news, the US government is bringing criminal charges against Edward Snowden today he came out as the leader of classified NSA documents Edward Snowden it's Edward Snowden Edward Snowden Edward Snowden my name is Snowden I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA It's been two years since NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden leaks top secret documents to the media, detailing the most expansive domestic and international spy program ever devised. Despite this huge trove of data, for the most part, the American public has moved on from this story without much consequence. In an effort to refocus the national dialogue about the threats to civil liberties that these leaks uncovered, a group of artists decided to make a bust of Edward Snowden and install it in New York City. We're used to seeing in our daily vocabulary in society statues of buses and warriors. We chose to pay tribute to Snowden through the medium of a bus because that is one of the visual pieces that society uses as a uh, guidepost to who a hero is. We think the wool is being pulled over people's eyes. You know, once we were exposed to some of these ideas, we were kind of outraged at sort of the way that the media was spreading things. And we wanted an opportunity for people to make their own minds. It took the sculptor nearly six months to mold and complete the bust. The artists then had to wait several weeks for the weather to improve before they installed it at the prison ship Martyrs Monument. It's really not just about the bust, it's about the context, because we feel it's a continuation of a story that started hundreds of years ago. In the Revolutionary War, the British Army had these massive prison ships that were eventually sunk, and so these are people that died in part so that our country can have the freedoms that this country was founded on. <coughs> in polite debate about uh, touting your disdain for the way the system is, it kind of just stays the status quo. Without risk, there really is no reward. We look at this as a gift to the city, but, you know, gifts are sometimes not accepted. We've gone to great lengths to make sure that aesthetically, the item that we're placing there is honoring the aesthetics that are already in place. Everything from the width of the shoulders of the statue being the same width as the eagle's wings, to the bronze patina finish. Everything has been made so that it feels like a cohesive unit. But we're also installing it in a way that it could be removed without committing permanent damage to the structure. If this thing gets taken down right away, it's certainly a disappointment, but we think it'll be worth it thanks to the internet. The fact that a risk was taken, the fact that the image comes out of it, so this act was carried out by some artists, and uh, a few of us heard about it the, you know, the morning after this video was taken, um, the first morning of its existence, um, and I rode my bike over there at like 8.30 in the morning, and when I got there, it was being placed inside of a, a blue tarp. Uh, actually, I think there's a photo of that somewhere here. Um, oh, Vine is no longer a thing. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you can just sort of imagine Ed Snowden's head disappearing into one of these bags, just like he's on his way to Guantanamo Bay or something. Um, and, uh, and so I didn't actually get to see it, but I did run into one of the other Illuminator members uh, who was also coming to come check it out. 
And he was like, you know, we have to, it's not there. We have to like put it back. And, um, and so we ended up going there late that night and, uh, pulled off this, this shot, which was, um, a cloud of sort of smoke in the air. And then we projected into it and just sort of replaced both the text Snowden and the statue itself, uh, atop the pillar. Um, and this is interesting to me because, uh, it's like, uh, I think they say in the video, I don't know if I cut them off, but um, the, the sort of the act of doing that, regardless of whether or not a statue gets taken down, is really important. And actually, uh, because everyone on the internet that was you know, paying attention to this sort of work knew that that had happened, the statue's absence was also a kind of a heavy presence. Um, and I think that this, our being able to put it back... Um, Kind of exemplifies that and, and allows allows the their original action to kind of like keep stay alive regardless of whether or not it's in the hands of the NYPD. Um, ah yes, and uh, there's another project that we that we did as a collaboration called uh, Taxi Vader. This is one of my personal favorites. I'm actually just going to load up the website because it's amazing. Um, so this was a collaboration with uh, a few people, including um, Mala Industria, who did the principal programming on the game. They're an amazing, radical, one-person uh, gaming collective that you should check out. Um, so the game is Tax Evaders, and the idea is that it puts all these companies that don't pay taxes every year, like Facebook and Citibank, uh, GE, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it sort of recasts them as these alien bad guys, that you, the player, controlling this team of protesters down here, sort of shoot down with people power. Um, so you can see you kind of like run around and then fire fists into the air. And as you uh, destroy the aliens with people power, um, their money sort of trickles back down into uh, vital so social services. Uh, I'll just be. I love this game, so I'm gonna beat the level real quick. <laughs> um, and so, uh, what we did was made it projectable and controllable with a Nintendo Wiimote so that we could uh, allow people to play it in public spaces. And I'll show you what that looks like. <laughs> Um, so here's some people enjoying the game on Citibank. <laughs> and this was a really good example of a project that was super engaging. Um, people that we had never met before would come join us uh, and play the game. And also the Light Brigade, another excellent uh, political arts collective in New York. Uh, and actually there's quite a few of them around the United States. Uh, they came out also. Um, and something that uh, kind of inevitably comes up is this question of, do you ever get in trouble? And definitely the answer is, is yes. Um, this is a terrible image of a projection that we did onto the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So this was um, David H. Koch, who is one of the two Koch brothers, um, there's this kind of mythology about the Tea Party that they are somehow a grassroots organization, but they were, in fact, directly funded by billionaires, um, the Koch brothers being two of them. Um, and so one of them, David Koch, was having uh, his inaugural uh, dinner party at the Met after donating $65 million to them to have his name emblazoned on their property, which sits atop public land, Central Park. Um, so we went there with a few uh, like-minded groups, and with the plan of projecting a few choice slogans, uh, my personal favorite was the Met brought to you by the Tea Party. Um, but the one that we were projecting when we got in trouble and not projecting very well, obviously, was Coke equals climate chaos. And I honestly had to came and read the, the Met Museum. The Met is a museum, not an oil lobby. Um, and so we projected this and we're immediately met with about 30 police officers um, taken into custody until like 3 a.m. Um, my very obvious privilege probably played a part in the fact that I 
uh, got out of jail unharmed with my two friends. Um, but they did keep uh, the projector for two and a half months, um, thereby kind of taking away our freedom to express ourselves during that time, which was a very um, wild time. I mean, that was, uh, I think, during the uh, big environmental summit that was going on there. Um, and luckily, the criminal charges were dropped. Uh, the criminal charges were illegal posting of advertising, which is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, because we were protesting uh, David Koch putting his name on public land. Um, but the two, there's actually, there's, there's three qualifications for illegal posting of advertisements, and I forget one. I think it's maybe not that interesting. But the other two are that you permanently affix something to a building. Um, and I think this is meant to keep people from wheat pasting like concert posters everywhere across the city, which is, you know, it's fine by me. I don't necessarily want to see that everywhere. Um, and then the other is that we stand to gain something uh, financially from doing what we are doing. So neither of these things applied to us. And a judge threw it out. And we're currently engaged in a civil suit against the NYPD for a First Amendment violation and prior restraint. Uh, but that is ongoing. And I'll let you know. If, if we win, I'm going to throw a huge party and you're all invited. Um, and that kind of brings me to, uh, to now. Uh, so we're here and we're still thinking about how we want to use uh, technology to sort of creatively uh, engage with politics. And what that means inside the context of an art gallery is an interesting question to us. Um, and you're going to you know, be able to see it in just a second. But I will speak briefly about uh, this project in particular that was kind of something that I've been working on for a little while and is an extension of the project we did in Montreal, the protest generator. Um, so the idea is that... Well, actually, I'm going to show you a video. So you're going to walk in. Oh, my God. And then you can take a piece of paper and write uh, a protest sign, essentially, um, like you would if you were going to a march. And then you drop it on the scanner, press the green button, and... Um, uh, after you do that, after a few seconds, a 3D avatar will appear uh, on the wall carrying the sign that you just made. Uh, and that will stay in circulation throughout the duration of the show. And the more people that participate, uh, the more protesters there will be, the more sort of political presence, the residue of, of all of your you know, um, political demands will remain in that gallery for the duration of that time uh, of the show. And... Uh, we're thinking about how this might be used in the future um, to, say, uh, bring someone who maybe isn't allowed to be here, like someone that's affected by the Muslim ban, or someone like um, Chelsea Manning or Ed Snowden, and allow them to have their presence in physical space without actual access. Um, and eventually, uh, the with enough participation, you get a kind of a procession that looks like this. So I invite you all to help uh, to collaborate in the project and you know make it realize its full potential. And also I'm inviting you to come along with us tonight at 7 p.m. to turn Colgate into a bit of a canvas. So for anyone who's interested we're going to be projecting uh, onto buildings and sort of allowing you to express yourselves in that medium. And we're going to try and quickly take that video photo documentation and uh, implement it into the show so that will also become part of the exhibition. Um, so please join us at 7. And uh, I think that's, that's my spiel. So thank you. Thank you.